So the man I'm going to talk about, a lot of you probably have never heard of, of, of John Sanborn. How many have heard of him before? Some of you Civil War guys and people like that? Good. Well, you have to remember that um, he was from St. Paul, and so when he arrived here as an eager and confident 28-year-old uh, New Hampshire attorney in 1854, uh, uh, little did he know at that time what legacy he would leave in that city, the state of Minnesota and the United States. That legacy, created mostly by the Civil War, lasted for his generation and the one or two that followed. And that was pretty much it. You see, except for those immersed in Minnesota's role in the Civil War, not many have heard of John Benjamin Sanborn or know about the role he played in the war. He, like more, many over a century in the grave, are not well remembered. Yet, of the many commanders that led men from the state, he rivals William Colville in remembrances and memorials. Parts of him are still around today. Found in the written word through personal effects, his name is etched in stone, and his likeness is cast in bronze and created in oil paintings. If you've been to the Minnesota History Center and seen the exhibit, Minnesota in the Civil War, you will see an exhibit case dedicated to a lot of his military accoutrements or equipment. And so those are just some of the things you would see on display there. How many of you have been to Oakland Cemetery in St. Paul? Have you come across his big memorial stone? Pretty impressive, isn't it? Well, he has all of the battles he participated etched in the side of that stone. You can see it right here. And at the base, can you read that? Boldly stating, General Sanborn. Have you been, any of you been to Vicksburg? National, yep, yeah, Vicksburg. Did you ever remember driving around the road and seeing next to the Minnesota Memorial, the monument, the 90-foot obelisk, his bust right next to that? So that's depicted here. But you don't have to travel hundreds of miles to see other artwork commemorating this brigade commander. If you walk around the second floor of the state capitol rotunda, you will see in one of the four niches a heroic sized statue of John Sanborn. Not too far away, if you were to look to your right, is a large statue of William Colville that, that Al had mentioned. If you wind your way down to the governor's reception room, you will see him portrayed as the horse rider in the Francis Miller painting, the fourth Minnesota entering Vicksburg, leading the men of his brigade into the captured city. So what warranted him being remembered in this manner by his peers and others who knew the man? He came to St. Paul with his business partner, Theodore French, and within two weeks of their arrival, they opened their law firm, Sanborn and French, on, on January 1st, 1855, Shortly after, they added another partner, and they became known as Sanborn, French, and Lund, and were a very respected, very um, highly uh, regarded law firm in the city at that time. During our statehood year in 1858, Sanborn appeared in front of the state Supreme Court four different times, and throughout his legal career, appeared, appeared in many ca court cases in state and federal court hearings. His abilities for leadership and decision-making were evident to his constituents in St. Paul, Democratic stronghold when they elected him as a Republican to serve in the House of Representatives in 1859. And also during a period in the United States when U.S. Senators were elected from the state legislatures, he lost the nomination of his caucus of the Republican Party by two votes to then the eventual Senator Martin Wilkinson. So he had a lot of high regard amongst his colleagues as well. His legislative career c continued. In 1861, he served in the state senate, but any future political aspirations disappeared when the legislative session ended just a few days before the beginning of the Civil War. So as we look at the remaining photos, you'll see he never loses his facial hair. Like, you know, that Colville grew his hair. This guy always had this facial hair, so. And you'll see that in every depiction of him. But following the resignation of Adjutant General William Acker, who volunteered with the 1st Minnesota Infantry, Sanborn was appointed the Adjutant General of the state in April of 1861. So during the 10 months he served in this role, he organized and equipped four infantry regiments, the 1st through the 4th Minnesota, two artillery batteries and four cavalry units, which is close to half of all the units that served from Minnesota during the war. As a reward for his services, organization leadership skills, he was commissioned colonel of the 4th Minnesota Infantry Regiment 
November of 1861. Sent to the Western Theater, the regiment was assigned to the Army of the Mississippi under the command of General Rosecrans. And then it later became part of the 7th Division of the 17th Army Corps, uh, led by General McPherson of, and uh, also part of the Army of the Tennessee, which was under the command of U.S. Grant. His military responsibilities quickly rose. Not only did he command the 4th Minnesota, he led brigades and a division and his own independent command during his military career. He was promoted a Brigadier General on August 4, 1863 and a Brevet Major General of Volunteers by the war's end. He survived 20 battles and skirmishes and a total of 60 days under fire during the war. He counted the 47-day siege of Vicksburg, which just about every day they're lobbing <coughs> shells or sharpshooters are shooting at the guys in the trenches. He counts that as one of the 60 days. <laughs> so he probably was under fire much more than, than 60 days. Years later, Sanborn stated that his command never failed to execute an order, never driven from a position, never pursued by the enemy, and never suffered the capture of a sound soldier. Let's take another look at that 4th Minnesota painting and showing them entering Vicksburg. And if you look at that, you'll see he's the horse rider, as we mentioned, but his men are right directly behind him. That's all the 4th Minnesota, and then his brigade trails the 4th Minnesota. And then the large building in the back is the Warren County Courthouse. And so if you look, I don't know if you can see that very well, but if you look at the cupola, you'll see there are flags, maybe a couple flags hanging out the, the windows of the cupola. That, there was already Union troops that had snuck in or gotten into the city. So um, what he was given the uh, responsibility from General McPherson was to lead, he would be the leading brigade to occupy that city. And that was a huge honor uh, for the brigade and for the 4th Minnesota. And uh, the other responsibility they were supposed to do once he moved into the city was to parole all the, conf uh, all the Confederate soldiers that had surrendered. But when you look at all the paintings in the governor's reception room, this is the only one conveying a non-combative scene. To achieve this moment, this brief time of peace was truly remarkable. In reality, it was the end result of over a year's worth of planning, overcoming obstacles and frustration, grueling marches and tide-turning battles, in the attempt to capture the city and change the course of the war in the West. Now the town of Vicksburg, Mississippi was a, a trade center built on the river bluffs of the Mississippi River and became a vital lifeline for the South when the war began. The Confederate stronghold controlled goods, supplies, and troops up and down the river and also ability to move supplies and men from Arkansas and Texas. So it was a really a, a huge part of the success of the Confederate uh, nation was to make sure they kept, our, uh, kept Vicksburg intact. That was commanded by Lieutenant General John Pemberton. And um, he, of course, was a Pennsylvania man, which is ironic because after he surrendered, that was one of the criticisms he had for many years was, you were really a northern sympathizer, weren't you? But he really wasn't. He was a, a strict command uh, leader for the Confederate armies. But to... Uh, make this uh, Vicksburg pretty much uh, impenetrable, they dug nine miles of trenches all around the north and the west side of the city and then built several forts and redoubts and clear cut all the ground in front of the trenches and so forth. So it was really a difficult thing for any army to approach and take over the city. And that in addition was surrounded by all kinds of wooded gullies and ravines. So just to get your men into position to attack was very difficult for the Union Army. The other thing is they placed a number of large gun emplacements on top of the bluff and on the waterfront with the intent of basically sinking anything that tried to run by the city of Vicksburg. So that was one of the tactics that Grant will use later on, and we'll see in just a minute. But numerous attempts by Grant in 1862 and 1863 were made to find a way to circumnavigate this fortress. These included land and waterborne assaults north of the city and the digging of canals to avoid the guns. Each attempt met with failure. Finally, Grant marched his army down the west side of the river and had his gunboats run the gauntlet past the heavy guns protecting the city. Once that was accomplished, he ferried his forces across the river south of Vicksburg. What followed was one of the most brilliant cam military campaigns of the Civil War. Beginning in May 1863, for 17 days, Grant's forces cut across central Mississippi and uh, basically you know, General Sherman's famous for 
basically getting rid of his wagon trains and living off the land. This is the first time Grant did this. He did not have his wagon trains behind him or supplies. He was having his men live off the land. So this is a precursor to what strategy and tactics would be used later on in the war. But because of them getting across the river, Pemberton brought his troops out of the defenses of Vicksburg, basically trying to stop the Union advance. But he was unable to reinforce, be reinforced by General um, Joseph Johnson's troops, which were in Jackson, the capital city, and uh, basically in a series of battles was defeated. So then he hightailed it back into the defenses of Vicksburg. Uh, once they were kind of isolated back in the city, Grant tried on two different days, May 21st and May 22nd, to assault the defenses. And that met with a, a, lot, of, a lot of problems. He wasn't very successful at doing that. And the next option then was to lay siege this, to the city. So for 47 days, um, Vicksburg and its defenders were slowly being constricted by the forward Union moving trenches. Also, they didn't have enough food, and of course, without any reinforcements, there was no way they were going to succeed. So on July 4th, 30,000 Confederate soldiers surrendered, and um, with the victory of Port Hudson a few days after the surrender of that city, the Union Army had control of the Mississippi River from Lake Itasca all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So coupled with the Battle of Gettysburg and the Union uh, victory at Vicksburg, these were two of the most crucial uh, victories for the, the North during the Civil War. So let's look at that painting once again. I often wonder what John Sanborn, was, who participated in most of the action during the Vicksburg campaign, was thinking about or remembering about the last year of combat as he prepared for this day and donned his new uniform before proudly riding into the city. As he pulled on his boots in his tent, he might have been thinking back to a horrific scene at the Battle of Iuka, Mississippi in September of 1862. It was the fourth Minnesota's baptism of fire and his first battle too, not as a colonel of the regiment, but as a brigade commander. Grant had designed a strategy to have two of his armies use a pincer movement to uh, destroy um, uh, General Sterling Price's army, but with only one of the armies engaged, um, it wasn't very successful, but his brigade did most of the fighting that day. And that ultimately, through the well, various episodes of that battle, became a Union victory. But even though his actions in battle received high praise and a recommendation for promotion, he might have recalled placing the five infantry regiments and two batteries of artillery on top of a hill that slope was a tangle of trees and underbrush. As the battle raged around him, with numerous assaults up and down the hill by both sides, he was only a few yards away when the colonel of the 48th Indiana was shot down. Both he and his horse were, uh, his horse was killed, he was severely wounded, I think he had three or four bullets in him. He survived. Uh, the 48th men were retreating back up the hill in disarray, and another Confederate uh, regiment was flanking one side of that, uh, that regiment. So these men were starting to be intermingled as they were retreating back up the, uh, up the slope. In reserve was the 16th Iowa, and they stood in the gap. But seeing that the Indianans were too close to the Confederates, Sanborn recalled yelling above the din of the battle to have them hold their fire until the 48th Indiana men got through to save ground. Well, the Iowans held their fire as long as they could, but now their line was being threatened by the quickly advancing rebels. So they opened fire on the Confederate soldiers just a few yards away. Unfortunately, only half of the 48th had made it to safety. So that one volley cleared away all the men on the crest of that ridge, both north and south. So there were actually a really sad part of that story is there were 100 men from the 48th that were killed or wounded in that one volley. Sanborn might have closed his eyes tightly as that one scene played over and over in his head. That one volley was the most cruel and destructive sight that he had witnessed during the war. Picking up his new uniform coat, purchased in preparation for this day, and dusting off the shoulders before he pulled it on, he might have been thinking back to the 4th Minnesota's exploits at the Battle of Corinth in October of 1862. Even though it was already nine months ago, to him, it seemed like it was yesterday when his men, as if on battalion drill, changed fronts and wheeled around and charged in good order at the double quick to the Confederate lines located 150 yards away. A soft smile might have crossed his face as he recalled the enemy retreating when his men closed within 50 yards. 
As he straightened out the sleeves of his shirt under the coat, he might have remembered during the march to Vicksburg the artillery fire his men encountered at the Battle of Raymond and how close he came to be seriously wounded or killed after a shell fragment flew under his arm, close enough to leave a permanent mark. His memory could have moved quickly to a more pleasant thought, to the excitement two days later when Jackson, the capital city of Mississippi, fell to the Union Army. He finally remembered one of his staff officers rushing ahead of the skirmishers as they entered the town, grabbing the, the national colors of the 59th Indiana and running as fast as he could to be the first to plant or raise a flag above the dome of their capital building. So that was something that any time it would take a city that was seen as a, a success, and especially a capital city, that was even a, a, a real moment of success for uh, General Grant's army. As he moved over to his cot and picked up the, uh, uh, his officer's sash and started wrapping it around his waist, the memory might have come flooding back to him and his brigade at the Battle of Champions Hill, which was the biggest fight leading up to the attack of Vicksburg. He pictured his men, many recognizable faces from the 4th Minnesota, escorting back to the Union lines, 118 prisoners taken after they flanked the retreating Confederates. Buckling his sword belt and hooking on his sword, his memories might have taken a darker turn. He might have remembered taking the colonels from his brigade in the middle of the night on May 21st outside the Vicksburg defenses where they were, would be attacking the next day. He wanted them to survey the ground and examine the ditch uh, at the base of the rebel redoubts and the clear cut open ground that they would have to co uh, cover the next day during the assault. Even in the dark, he discovered to his dismay that advancing <coughs> under fire through the abatis appeared to be impossible. The felled trees and lopped limbs were spread out from four to six feet high and were all interlocking and so thick that it was impossible for anyone to get through. The only way his men would be successful was to crawl like snakes just like he and his commanders were doing on this nighttime reconnaissance. Picking up his hat, he might have thought back to the assault on the Confederate defenses the following day on May 22nd, when he was temporarily in command of the 7th Division outside of Vicksburg. He might have felt his teeth clench and cheeks warm in anger as he recalled reading the words on the order to send his men, who had already been under fire most of the day, to assist General McClernand's forces in another attempt to breach the defenses. He had memorized the order and recited it in his head. General Grant, I am in part possession of three of the enemy's works, and the flag of the United States waves over the stronghold of Vicksburg. If my right can be properly supported, I can carry the enemy, enemy's position in an hour. McClernand. On the back of the dispatch were the following words. General McPherson, commanding 17th Corps, will send one division of his corps to the support of McClernand's right. Grant. Then followed. Commanding officer of 7th Division, 17th Corps, will immediately move with his command to the support of Major General McClernand's right, McPherson. That was John Sanborn's division that day. The results of the order was a tally of 12 killed and 42 wounded from the 4th Minnesota and over 200 casualties in his brigade alone. As he ran his hand around the brim of the hat before he put it on, he might have remembered John Tortlett, who was the acting colonel of the 4th Minnesota, coming to him in the middle of the attack and telling him his men were holding their own upon the dead ground. They could go over the top if so ordered, but unless they were supported, it might mean the sacrifice of most of the men. He might have thought back to the moment, trying to process the news, but at the same time, couldn't shake the image of staring at the bearded toilet, holding up his hat showing where a bullet had cut through it, and then looking at the top of the colonel's head where the bullet had shaved away his hair above the scalp. He remembered asking for the support of the brigade next to him, but after finding out his friend and brigade commander, Colonel, Colonel Boomer of the 26th Missouri, was killed earlier during the assault, when darkness fell, he pulled his division off the battlefield. And they were one of the last to leave the battle that day. So I'm sure when he sat on his horse and led his men into the city, it was with mixed emotion. On one hand, he realized the victory at Vicksburg could be the pivot point that helped shorten the war. But until that time, the war would go on and his band of brother commanders and their men, his men, would continue to die. On the other hand, he was filled with pride of the entire Union Army, 50,000 strong, and its 46 infantry brigades, which composed of 190 infantry regiments, his brigade composed of the 4th Minnesota, the 48th and 59th Indiana, and the 18th Wisconsin, was selected and given the honor to occupy the city. It was a highlight of his military career. 
Beyond that, seeing the results firsthand of what a capable general can accomplish, he was willing to do whatever his commander, General Grant, would ask of him. After the surrender of Vicksburg and serving as Provost Guard, his first command, the 4th Minnesota, and other soldiers from his brigade marched east in September of 1863, but without John Sanborn. His military career and course steered him west. In a room filled with other brigade commanders, General Grant selected him for reassignment to the Division of Southwest Missouri to deal with guerrilla fighting and the brutal killings of Union sympathizers in that state. In 1864, he confronted once again the forces of General Sterling Price in a series of engagements and battles that um, pushed all the Confederate forces out of Missouri for the last time. After the war, he assumed command of the District of Upper Can Arkansas, which is pretty much where Kansas is, and was directed to negotiate with the Indian tribes in Oklahoma to have them emancipate their slaves now that the war was over. If you remember, the civilized tribes were slave owners, and so you had to make sure all the slaves were free no matter um, what background or what, what uh, group of people had them. He also served as a commissioner for two treaties known as the Little Arkansas Treaty in 1865 and the Medicine Lodge Treaties in 1867 with the Comanche, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Kiowa Apache people. After packing away his uniform, he took up the practice of law again, first in Washington, Washington D.C. and then later in St. Paul. He served again in the State House of Representatives in the 1870s and the, and the State Senate in the 1890s. He also served on the Executive Council of the Minnesota Historical Society for over 28 years and succeeded Alexander Ramsey as its president. He, he had accomplished much when he passed away at age 78 in 1904. So as you can see, John Benjamin Sanborn rose to the ranks to attain some of the highest command of any field officer from the state. His sharp mind allowed him to act with alacrity and responsibly in each engagement he participated. This was proven over and over again to his peers and the soldiers who fought with or under him. Those positions of leadership accord responsibility, and how you act accordingly determines how you are remembered. When General Sanborn passed away, in one memorial address, the eulogist noted that his greatest claim was his ability and accomplishments as a soldier. Sixty days under fire and surviving the Civil War were of major accomplishments. That, at a minimum, is worthy of being remembered. But when you factor in his role at the Battles of Iuka, at Corinth, Champions Hill, and Vicksburg, it becomes more clear why statues, busts, and significant oil painting represents one of the finest military commanders Minnesota offered during the war. 